do people come in and essentially lie to you? A lot of people are just really straight up honest now. They're like, yeah, I was, uh, you know, putting this up my butt and uh, I couldn't get it back <laughs> out. And you're like, all right, well, here we are. The good. Welcome to The Good, The Bad, and The Science, the show that breaks down the science of television and movies with a comedian and a scientist. Today we're discussing jackass. So I'll ask about pain tolerance, bruising, and wasabi snooters? Hi everyone, I'm your host Ethan Enberg and I've got two fascinating guests joining me today. My first guest is a video producer and comedian who launched Don't Tell Comedy, a pop-up comedy show that is now in over 45 cities. Welcome to the show, Cole Garrett. Thanks. Stoked to be here. I'm stoked you're here, and I'm stoked that you have adequate beverages. We were just discussing your multitude of liquids, so I'm glad to have you and your three friends on the program. Yeah, we're all happy to be here. Thanks, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to know their names. Uh, no, so uh, my, my first question before I get to our second guest for you, because of this movie, what mm -hmm. is the dumbest, most jackass thing that you've ever done? Me personally, I mean, that's in line with that kind of stuff. Oh, man. Well, I grew up in Orange County, so there's, like, a lot of, like, skateboard culture there, I think. And, like, so right. I think I kind of, I grew up idolizing these guys for sure. So, yeah. like, we used to go out and we would try to reenact these things. So a lot of the things that you, like, see in the movie, like, me and, like, my eight-year-old friends or whatever it came out originally on MTV, we were young. But we would go mm -hmm. out, we'd push each other around in the carts, slam them into curbs, you know. We we used to we used to live by a couple of uh, golf courses too, and we'd do the thing where we'd go out with the air horns, and we'd <laughs> air horn cool. people right in their back <laughs> swing, <laughs> and uh, like that was always. Fun. I mean, we were always getting into stuff too. I grew up near like the beaches and stuff, so a lot of the kids that I grew up with were kind of like adrenaline junkies. So we used to like jump off a lot of cliffs into the water and stuff like that. And Man. I so mean, exactly what they tell you not to do at the beginning yeah. of the movie. Yeah, exa yeah. <laughs> yeah awesome. exactly. Yeah, exactly. And did you, did you take up skateboarding? Because that was also something that ever since I was little, I thought was like the epitome of cool. And I only tried it once. I fell and then immediately couldn't ever do it again. I was way too afraid. Yeah, 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 yeah. I skated, like, my whole childhood, I skateboarded, uh, wow. yeah, all, all throughout Orange County, and it definitely hit a point where I was, like, you know, I played a lot of sports, too, and it was, like, skateboarding or sports, because, dude, you get hurt on a skateboard a lot, and then right. I kind of, like, gave up for, like, four years, started playing a lot of sports, and then I was, like, you know what, I'm gonna pick up my skateboard again, and I went to a skate park, and, like, went up and like rode this bowl and I came down and I just like hit my knee so hard. And I remember just being like, I'm done with this. Like yep. <laughs> getting hurt is not cool anymore. Like I'm going to be limping for like a week. <laughs> well, good on you. I'm, I'm glad <laughs> yeah. to hear it because I really, I, I, I can't get into that mental place of just being yeah. cool with uh, serious injuries. Uh, but our next guest is someone who takes serious injuries very seriously. He is a resident physician, uh, physician sorry, and founder of The Med Life, which has been featured on major news outlets such as NBC, CNET, Newsweek, Yahoo, Business, Fox, and U.S. World News. Welcome to the show, Dr. Adam Goodkoff. Appreciate it, Ethan. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I am delighted that you're here. I spent the morning watching a bunch of your videos, which were absolutely fantastic. Really love them. Um, and uh, and I got to ask you the same thing. I know you're a doctor. I know you're a stand up citizen. You save human <laughs> lives. But what's the most dumb jackass thing that you've ever done? You know, it's, it's funny listening to Cole talk. We did the same thing growing up. Um, <laughs> I, I am a doctor now, but uh, I still do a lot of action sports. And uh, it was it's kind of the same. I grew up in New York, but uh, grew up racing motocross and, uh, you know, doing BMX. And I was a big downhill mountain biker, uh, skier, all of that stuff. So, uh, yeah, we used to get in um, my buddy, who's actually my manager now, um, and set this up. We used to get in a wagon in his backyard and just launch it off of one of those uh, ramps from Walmart uh, with as many people as we could in it. So it was uh, it was more of the same. Funny. And uh, I remember someone had like impaled themselves with like a stick at one point, and they they got up and they had like this like little like twig going through the side of their arm. And we're like, oh, cool. 
All right. <laughs> Sick. So, We're real. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, more of the same, but uh, thankfully I do a lot less of that now and uh, try not to hurt myself and, and more help other people who uh, are unfortunately in that spot. Yeah, definitely. So you, you were mentioning that there are still some extreme sports that you partake in to this day? Yeah, I, I think uh, depending on how extreme they are. I mean, I just got back from the Alps. I was skiing. Um, you know, anytime I get the chance uh, to, to be outdoors, if I can go downhill, mountain biking, still love doing that. Wow. And uh, I wish I had the time to, to do motocross or actually I, I had a like a Yamaha R6 that was track spec uh, for a while. So I really miss riding on the track as well. That would be Sometime when I have the money and time again to do it, I would I would be happy to uh, get back on the racetrack. My God! So th- seeing these injuries doesn't uh, dissuade you. You're you're still down. Yeah, the only thing I don't do is ride motorcycles on the street anymore. Um, I think that's just for me. That's an unnecessary risk because it's it's out of your hands. Uh, I see a lot of people yes. in very bad shape after that. Um, you know, in a car, you can get hit by another driver and pretty much walk away these days. Um, you're not going to walk away from a motorcycle accident. So uh, that's that's why I took those to the street, and I, I've had no desire to come back. I, I'd much rather just have a fast car. Thank you for saying so, by the way. I don't know if you feel the same way, Cole, but any time that I see somebody on a motorcycle, and no offense to anybody that rides, we've had guests that ride motorcycles on the show, and I've told them as well, I think it's absolutely bonkers. It just <laughs> seems like you are asking for it. Uh, even if you do walk away, it seems like you're somehow you're going to be scarred for life eventually. Dude, a hundred percent. I just want to say too, like you have got to be the coolest doctor <laughs> I've ever heard of. Like, Appreciate that. Appreciate unreal. That. <laughs> like downhill skiing, racing, street bikes, yeah. Doctor Cool, dude. Yeah. Uh, I I grew up I grew up riding dirt bikes as well. Uh, oh, and nice. actually, it's funny that you guys are talking about this now. Because lately I've been obsessed with getting like a dual sport, something I can ride on the street and on the dirt. And I'm actually yeah. going to get my motorcycle license next week. Whoa. So this is bad timing. Yeah. <laughs> no coal. Yeah. Step. Really they, uh, it. They, they, they are. Ing- actually, the reason that I couldn't ever buy a dual sport is because... Um, I love wheeling, and I would 100% get arrested if I had a uh, supermoto. Dude, yeah. Dr. Wheelie. Yeah. Dude, next you're going to yeah. be like, and you know, sometimes I dabble in jumping them over canyons. <laughs> yeah. No. Every now and then I'll jump out of a plane and onto yeah. a bike and yeah, do a half pipe. This is awesome. So you guys seem like the perfect pair to help navigate me through this movie. Um, yeah. I also will say that I just... Uh, a few days ago, went to the theater and watched the new Jackass movie. So I, I have to ask if... Oh, okay, great. Um, uh, Dr. Goodkoff, have you seen that film? I, I sadly have not seen the whole thing, but we were very oh. fortunate to be part of the promotion. So I got a little bit of an early look at some of the things and, and we did some work with uh, with Paramount. So it was... Uh, cool. It looks really great. I was out of the country when it came out, um, but hoping to see it. Nice. Yeah, it was awesome. And I I was really almost trippy watching both of these so close together uh, just because they've come such a long way. And I know that sounds like one of the silliest things that you can say about the Jackass movies, but uh, but it's true. I mean, didn't you feel like that, Cole? Like rewatching this, I I, I didn't remember. I mean, first of all, it's Mm -hmm. scary how much I remember of this movie. It's Mm -hmm. like I forgot so many important things in my life and yet. I haven't seen this movie probably like 15 years or something, and I knew it like back to front, which was really weird. But then also just, yeah, like quality-wise and stuff, it was like completely night and day from what they're doing in the new one. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, I I actually saw the new one last night uh, for a Valentine's Day date, if that kind of gives you any (laughs) idea of what me and my fiancé are like. Um, (laughs) Yeah, we went out and saw that. And uh, and then I watched uh, I watched the old one, the original one today. And it's just like you you said, there are some crazy differences between the two. Like one thing that I forgot about the original was just like how simple the setups used to be. Like totally. it was so simple. Like one of the ones was like, you know, Preston Lacey just goes to sit on a bench. Like that's it. He goes right. to sit, he goes to sit on a bench and it collapses and breaks. <laughs> And his, like, pants rip, and then he just runs away embarrassed. And it's like, oh, my God, like, this is so funny and so simple. And I was thinking, like, why, you know, why did it get so complex as the movies got further along? And one thing I was thinking was, like, 
it's because they got like they can't do that anymore. They get recognized. So like mm -hmm. now it's more about like the stunts and like making right. it bigger and their budgets I'm sure are have like, you know, quadrupled um since the first movie. But Yeah. Yeah. I was curious about the budgets by the way and I will say they're still small. Like the first movie I I found was only 5 million dollars the budget and it made like 80 something million dollars. And that kind of mm. goes for all of them. They've all been really successful box office hit films. Um, but even I think the new one was only like 20 million, which isn't, you know, an exorbitant amount for a film. Um, but uh, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely a lot more creative. I loved how unexpected a lot of the 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 comedy is really of these new ones. Whereas you're right on these on the old ones. It was like guys just kind of hanging out, daring each other to do stupid crap. You know, one of the scenes from this one, for example, uh, was just called Paper Cuts, I think. And mm -hmm. it was just them hanging out like in a hotel room. And somebody with a camcorder filming uh, them give each other paper cuts. So I was like, yeah. man, it really has, you know, now we have all these contraptions, kind of Rube Goldberg, uh, you know, machines that are all kind of synced up. So anyways, I, I highly recommend seeing the new one if you haven't. But today we're talking about the first one. And in this movie, there's all sorts of injuries that I want to get your uh, your expertise on here, uh, Adam, if I if I may call you that, or or Doc, yeah, or do. Doctor Cool, no. as uh, Cole has uh, <laughs> nicknamed you, Doctor Wheelie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't prefer Doctor Wheelie? Okay, interesting. No, I, I I like it. I'll take it. But uh, Adam's fine. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, yeah. So the first one I wanted to to get to was was really just more of a an overall question for you, which is. People are known to recreate a lot of these jackass stunts, as stupid as that is. No offense to the two of you. So have you seen in your uh, in your experience people come in with with just very silly injuries, very silly accidents that you thought, OK, maybe they were inspired by this film or something similar? Yeah, all the time. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of what we do, actually, with our uh, our social media platform sometimes is trying to stop these things. We actually got, if you remember, the milk crate challenge from this summer. Uh, it was kind of this, like, yes. uh, they were stacking milk crates, which are not meant to be stacked on an unstable surface. And the problem is that people were falling from just the right height to kind of auto-rotate onto their neck and break their neck. So <sighs> um, we, we kind of did, a, me and a lot of other physicians, put out a lot of content basically being like, stop, this is not... It's not funny, you know, there's, it's funny if you fall and then you get up and everything's okay. It's not funny if you're paralyzed for the rest of your life. So, um, you know, wow. TikTok started taking those videos down. And so we see that all the time. We were seeing it, you know, I'm here um, in Chicago. And so there's there's a lot of folks that were, were doing that stuff. Um, and yeah, it was like one week, um, me and a ton of my colleagues were all, you know, texting me, oh, I saw another, you know, massive uh, humeral fracture or whatever it was from... Uh, from, from someone climbing on the milk crates. So it, it is, you see, you see that stuff, especially being in the emergency department. Um, you know, we we're the, the front line of kind of a lot of stuff that comes in before our colleagues see it or repair it. So, um, yeah, we, we get it all. Do people come in and essentially lie to you and say like, Oh, I tripped over this thing. And then you're kind of studying their injury and going, no, you didn't. This is, yeah. you did this on purpose. I I don't, I don't know if it's a generational thing. That's what a lot of people used to say. You know, they like slip and fell on something. And a lot of people are just really straight up honest now. They're like, yeah, I was, uh, you know, putting this up my butt and uh, I couldn't get it back out. And you're like, all right, well, here we are, you know. Um, How, that's, it, that's actually a good segue. How dangerous is that? Because that is one of the big stunts in this movie. He puts a, a toy car uh, up his butt and he goes right. to get an x-ray and the doctor tells him, you're not going to be able to poop this out. You got to go to a different doctor. And, uh, I mean, unfortunately we do see that he gets it out, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, how, how dangerous is that? I assume people should not attempt this type of stunt. Yeah. So, uh, 100% you should not be putting things that cannot be retrieved up your, up your rectum. Um, there is essentially, so we see this all the time, unfortunately. And there was, again, I, I'm not going to make everything about TikTok, but I think this is really funny. There, like the general public made a little campaign that you shouldn't be putting anything without a flared base up your butt. And I actually fully support that, that movement. Um, cause if you have like a flared base, it's not going to go, uh, too far up, but the problem is when something does go uh, up the rectum, that is a vacuum system. And so once it goes beyond the reach of your fingers there, um, it's, it's suctioned from the top. Um, so there is no actual way to remove that uh, if you can't break the suction once, oh, wow, it, once it gets God. up yeah, to a certain point. So 
what will happen a lot of times, because we do remove those foreign bodies um, frequently, especially if they're low enough and, and if it's safe enough. But the, the problem is the lining of your uh, intestine and colon and things are not meant to have firm things in there. Um, so they, they can be very easily damaged. So you can't really go in there with tools and safely, if you can't get a good grab on it. I mean, in, the, in this video, he actually has like a condom around it, I think, which makes it easier to grab. Um, but you know, a lot of folks are not doing that. And uh, so, so things, it's, it's more often like bottles and things, but like, uh, for example, if you, if you picture the bottom of like a shampoo bottle or something like that, it's got that little divot. If that goes in the top end, that's like a suction cup. And uh, yeah, it can actually lead to having, they'll take you to the OR and they have to actually cut out part of the colon usually. There's not really a way to remove it. And so, um, you know, that's how you end up with like an ostomy bag. And so these things, yeah, they, they become pretty, I, I don't think people realize the consequences for their actions a lot of time. And that's one where definitely, uh, you know, it's a pretty serious outcome. I've, I've always wanted to ask a doctor this. Did you ever see the video that was called One Man, One Jar, by any chance? <laughs> I, I think I know what you're referring to. Is that it? It's like Jar Squatters, the same, uh, is that the same thing? Jar, okay, so you've got a name for it. What was it? Jar Squatters? I, I thought it was called Jar Squatter. I, I, okay. I, his name. I, he, I, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have it saved under that name, yep. You've got a group called the Jar Squatters. Yeah, you guys yeah, meet on yeah. Sundays. It's um, a ska band. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what I'm talking about? So yes, yes. Okay, so that guy he sits on a jar, and mm -hmm. then it explodes. Yes. What do you think happened after that? <laughs> like, is, I, I, is there think... any way to recover from that? Yeah, no. I I think that's that is quite literally the worst case scenario. <laughs> I think what I was kind of referring to, where they have to take out part of the colon. Um, you know, I'm not a general surgeon, but my understanding of that is that would that would be the same as you know perforating your bowel, and they'd have to go in not only take that section out, but take all those pieces because now there's there's a communication from inside the rectum to the abdominal wall, uh, you know, inside the abdomen, I should say, and so. Uh, not only do those pieces of glass need to come out, but now you have feces inside of your abdomen, which is not supposed oh. to be there. So you have oh to be washed God. out, antibiotics. And absolutely, if you damage the rectum, you know, to that degree, they're going to have to reattach the intestine further up to your stomach. So you basically, that's what a, a colostomy is, where you're, you're pooping into a bag because the stool can't pass any further. So, um, you know, now knowing what I know, it's slightly less frightening, still horrifying. But um, yeah, that's it. You know, and then you have free glass in your abdomen, so you certainly you have your giant your aorta is in there, so you could you could cut the aorta and and bleed out from that. So it's it's pretty serious. Jesus, Jesus. So yeah. it yeah. sounds like the lesson here is that although we all think of the rectum as an exit, uh, things once they're up there, it's not easy for them to exit. It, it is not. No. No, it's it's pretty hard. I mean, if you think of like reasonably the size of the average stool, um, if it's much bigger than that, it's going to be pretty hard for it to come out. Okay, so I I had to ask about uh, I wanted to to ask about bruising, uh, bruising the body because we see uh, you know a few different ways that they are getting bruised up. One, for example, we see somebody get bowling balls uh, thrown into their crotchal region which I believe is the scientific terminology there. And then there's another section where Johnny Knoxville gets like this riot gun projectile shot into his belly. And then, you know, he bruises up. It's like red. And then they show it two days later. And it's actually like a much bigger bruise. And it almost has like a, yeah, like a different coloration to it. And so I was just curious how that all goes down, how the body, you know, heals itself and deals with that type of uh, blunt trauma. Sure. Uh, so I'll kind of do it surface level first. And if you want more, we can go there. But basically right. when you injure the body or have some kind of uh, bleeding underneath the skin, you'll see bruising. And that bruising can come in the form of whatever hit you and just the damage of the capillaries, which are the small vessels in that area. Or it can be larger. You can blow out, you know, if you've ever had an IV and it blows up, you get the big bruise where they let, where it was, uh, you know, where they took the IV out, there'll be kind of the purple area there. Um, that's from like leaking right out of the vein. So obviously a larger source and then bigger, if you kind of have a big injury and rupture a big vein or something like that, you're going to have, you know, a massive amount or you think of, you know, getting punched in the face. There's a lot of blood vessels there, you know, a, a, a ton of uh, blood will kind of come out and pool there. So what you see first is kind of that redness is just the inflammatory response to being hit in that area. Um, and then you get bruising, which is that blood seeping out and kind of sitting there. 
and that color change is very observant. I'm impressed. Um, that's as you transition yeah, from uh, kind of fresh blood as it goes and breaks down, our body kind of breaks blood down into bilirubin, um, which is a yellow looking pigment. So you can see that in kids, you can see it in alcoholics, but you also see it when you have a bruise breaking down. So it's kind of that looks like a banana um, as, as the blood products start to break down and be dissolved. And that's kind of the last stage of the healing of a bruise. And so it'll go from red to purple and then purple fades into that kind of dark uh, yellow and back to skin color and then eventually kind of resolves and that blood is resorbed from the area. Yeah, because I, I was concerned uh, about his, his belly rupture because they were mentioning organs being down there and such. And I was like almost shocked that they wasn't worse. Yeah, pretty much all of the stunts in those movies and, and especially in the latest one, we were watching some of the clips, you know. I watch them now and I'm like, man, they are so, so fortunate. Even in the, in the movie for today, you know, they roll the golf cart and I'm like, man, like he easily could have been paralyzed from that. I mean, just the right. position that he is on the ground. And, um, you know, I, I've seen so much that I've seen a lot less do a lot more. And so when you see stuff like this, you know, like taking all that force to the abdomen, um, you know, that's just like being in a car accident, uh, that amount of force. And you can easily rupture your spleen, you know, have a laceration to the liver. There's, there's a ton of serious outcomes. I wanted to ask you this. It brings up a good point that these guys are asking for it. Clearly, they're going out to hurt themselves over and over and over again. And yet they're all walking around like all is chill. Do you think they have some sort of genetic predisposition to either heal up quickly or, you know, a high pain tolerance? Uh, because, you know, I, I fall down you know, playing tennis and I'm out for months. So why, you know what I mean? Is there, do people just have a different, like, are, like athletes, maybe they're just like bred for it somehow. And I'm just a twig, like I'm unprepared. Yeah, I, uh, I can't address your personal situation. I don't know in that case, but, uh, I think that if you look at sports across the whole, you have, you know, your rugby, your football, hockey, supercross. I mean, supercross is a great example. These guys are falling a 75 foot triple. They're coming from 20 feet down and then they kind of fall, hit rock hard dirt and roll away. And I, I agree. I would not be getting up saying that was great. Um, but they get back up and they finish the race. And some of these guys, you know, will play football or, um, or hockey and things with, uh, broken ribs, um, broken right. bones in the wrist and tape things up. And so they, there is a pain tolerance component. Um, some people are very sensitive to pain and some people are very resistant to pain. Um, there are units and different things that you can kind of measure pain in. It's not something that we frequently do, but it's talked about. Um, and so, you know, how much something hurts and how much people are able to perceive of that pain varies. Um, so there is that component. I think there's also part of it is just a, a social component. You know, if you play, hockey or you play football the idea is that if you physically can move you'll move um, and the more you do those things you adapt to those the body's very uh, quick to adapt and so if you're constantly beating the body up and exposing to new levels of pain then those those you know things that are maybe a little bit less are going to become easier to tolerate and uh, mm -hmm. you know kind of goes from there so that's that's how I would guess but uh, I agree and like I said watching these you know um, uh, it, if you slip and fall, it hurts. And then all your bones hurt for a day and your joints are sore. You pulled your muscle, you're out of the gym for a week. Like, yeah. I, I, so I'm not sure how these guys are, are launching off of these things and, and getting up and doing it again the next day. I feel like some people too, like this is going to sound kind of crazy and maybe a little stupid, but some people are just good at falling. Like these guys, like they do it over and over. Like, it's like, I'll like relate it back to skateboarding. Like one of the things that when we used to skateboard a lot, like one of the things that you say about a good skateboarder is like, you're good at falling because like you see the way that they bail off their skateboards and some of these, like, do you guys know who Aaron Jaws Hamoki is? <laughs> Never heard of that about, guy? Tell us about Aaron Jaws Hamoki. Yeah, yeah, dude. So Aaron Jaws Hamoki, he's a legend. He's like, he's a pro skateboarder and he's like, he's best known for like throwing himself down like 30 stairs or like off of a two or three story building. He'll like ollie Whoa. off of like these enormous heights. And like, he definitely does not ever get it on the first try. So you see him just throwing his body off of these, like off the, off a roof and just smacking into the ground and he'll roll out of it. And you're like, Oh, he, he just exploded both of his feet for sure. And then he just gets up, 
kind of like shakes it off and goes and does it again. And he'll do it like sometimes 15, 20 times where like wow. if I were to try it once, my body would explode. You know what I right. mean? <laughs> like, yeah. But like he's just, he's figured out some sort of way of like lessening the impact with the way he falls. Like, I don't know, it's just weird. But like he's just he's, great at falling. He's built different, as they say. Yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, okay, well, I, I, I did want to talk about a few of those uh, falls. Like, there was one where Johnny Knoxville's grinding, rail grinding, 50-50 uh, uh, rail grinding, and then he falls and, like, basically just smacks his hip uh, onto the floor. And so I wanted to ask about that because I actually had a friend that had a, a hip surgery from, from playing tennis. And so, I mean, how, how much of an impact can we take to our to our hips because again I, I saw that one and I thought like oh he's for sure they need a stretcher this is going to be a whole procedure and and yeah he seemed like he was okay yeah the the hip is you know like the pelvis bone is kind of what we'd refer to it's made up of two main components you have the pelvis girdle itself which is the actual bone if you feel your hips that kind of sticks out um, but then you also have the top of your leg bone the femur that's coming into the hip there's this big ball and socket joint so um, unless you guys are playing like full tackle tennis, uh, it was probably some type of like a ligamentous injury, uh, you know, that, that would, would result from that. Uh, but when you're talking about like falling on the hip, that to me is more of like the pelvis or the bone, um, in that area. And one of the, one of the issues is any ring structure, um, you know, it spreads the force around a lot, uh, just the way mm. that the force is transmitted through the bones there. So, you know, I, I would defer to like an orthopedic surgeon as to sp specifics or where it breaks the most common, but w what can happen is you can get breaks at a lot of different positions just based on the force traveling through that. Um, so while it's a very strong bone and takes a lot of force, when you do break that, it's a, you know, a sign of a very, uh, serious injury. And then it's just person dependent, obviously things like how much you weigh, you know, we see a lot of times like overweight patients do end up getting injured more when they fall because there's just so much more weight coming down on the bone. Mm. Um, but on the flip side for something small, you know, if you have a lot of tissue over the bone, it's going to feel a lot less painful than if you're, you know, very skinny and you hit the bone directly on something that's going to be, be very uncomfortable. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's one of those things like if he falls from standing height, you know, it's not likely you're going to break your pelvis from that, um, you know, around the height of standing, um, in an average healthy person, uh, but it's, it's going to hurt like crazy. Okay, cool. Um, I, uh, I wanted to ask about the muscle stimulators also. There's a scene where they put these muscle stimulators first on this guy's chest and then eventually we all know where it's going onto their genitals. And so, I had to ask, you know, just number one, if you even can like support or sign off on muscle stimulators in general, are they, you know, safe, effective, and sh what happens when you put them where they don't belong? Sure. Uh, I think nothing that I say is official medical advice, but I'm happy to talk about the right. uh, the devices. Of course. Um, you know, they, yeah, of course. They, um, <laughs> They, they, they provide a small electrical current through the muscle. Physical therapy has been using these forever, and um, they use them in different ways to, to target muscles or to like rehabilitate uh, muscles after an injury. And I think they've, they've been using them for a long time without any issues. So at, at low um, doses, I think they're absolutely fine. Um, the idea is that they stimulate muscle and so there has to be electrical current passing through a muscle to cause it to contract, and that's essentially what's happening there. Um, putting them on the testicle would not cause any, there's not much muscle there. There's a very small muscle that kind of lifts the testicle, but that would not be uh, uh, helpful. So that would just be purely causing pain. Um, and they do, it's, you know, it's electrical current going through your skin. So if you ramp that up, uh, no matter where you put it, it's gonna hurt. Um, and I'm sure you've messed with it at, uh, you know, I've been in physical therapy too. And, you know, you're kind of, maybe I'll put it up another notch and it starts to like, everything tightens up and it hurts and it burns. And so that's, you know, the slow progression of how painful electricity can get. Um, so I think as a whole in the right application, they're probably safe, but, uh, you know, obviously misuse is a different thing. What about holding it in? And I'm talking about when you have to go to the bathroom. What is the science behind that? One uh, character, <laughs> it's not a character, he's just a guy, normal guy being filmed, uh, has a, a stunt he's trying to pull off where he has to go to the bathroom in a public place, and he <laughs> doesn't pull it off correctly because he goes too early. <laughs> so can you tell me about that? Uh, the biggest issue with with 
intentional withholding of, of going number two or stooling, uh, it's just really severe constipation. Um, so, I mean, if somebody has laxatives and things like that, obviously they're, that's going to win at some point. Um, but it, we see this a lot more in kids, actually. They, they'll have like a painful um, constipated bowel movement. They don't want to go again because it hurts and they don't understand. And so they'll actually hold their stool uh, and won't tell their parents or, you know, whatever it is for a couple of days. And it becomes a really wow. big issue because that stool will just continue to back up to the point where it is now so large and firm. Like we were talking earlier, if it's much bigger than a normal stool that comes out of the rectum, it's not going to come out. And so at that point you have to, to do something to get that out. So, uh, you know, the same goes for adults and we see it, unfortunately, in, in older folks who maybe aren't uh, with it as much anymore, um, where they're, you know, withholding uh, unintentionally. And it's the same thing. It can cause, you know, very severe constipation, um, ultimately to the point, And we do see this where it will stretch the, the walls of the rectum and actually thins out the tissue there oh. and basically causes inflammation to the point where the stool can kind of start to pass through, um, the, the membrane of the wall and start to cause an infection around that area. Damn. Yeah. That's yeah. serious. Serious business. <laughs> this is serious business. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I went to the hospital once for something like that. What happened? Yeah. If yeah, you don't I mind me to... asking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was like 15 years old, and I remember I just had the worst stomach pain I've ever had in my entire life, and I was freaking out. I was like, I, I've never felt anything like this to the to to a point where I was like bent over, and like my mom was like, "We're going to the hospital." So. Drove me to the hospital, went to the emergency room. Literally, like, I'm like 10 out of 10 pain. I'm like, this is something I've never heard of. This, I, I have some sort of horrible disease. And went to the doctor. They're like, what is it? It's just right in your stomach. They're like, okay. They gave me an ultrasound. And they're like, huh. You look like uh, you might be a little backed up. And I was like, what are you talking about? And they're like, we're just going to try something and <laughs> don't want to hear that <laughs> yeah and so they gave me an enema and mm. and then they they wheeled in like sort of like a porta potty they wheeled in like a little portable toilet put it by the bed and they're like if you can't make it across the hallway just right across the hallway to the bathroom this one's right here and i was like oh yeah like i won't be able to make it to the bathroom across the hallway and then, dude, like 30 minutes later, like clockwork, because they were like, oh, in 30 minutes, you'll probably be, dude, I had to, I had to hop off that bed so quickly, and I didn't even have time to close my hospital door. There were like nurses walking by, and I'll tell you what, I'll keep it PG. I relieved myself, dude, and then I literally got up, and I was like, let's check out. I'm good. Like I was fine. I feel great. I was yeah. fine. And that's all it was. I couldn't, I literally couldn't believe it. I was like, how did I not know this about myself? Like I, I'm like, I'm like 14 wow. years old. How did I not know I had to like go, you know? Yeah. What? I mean, Crazy. Did, you, did they like, uh, did they try to get to the bottom of that? Like, was it something like a you diet know thing or I, I, I don't think they were trying to dig any further. They just, they just, yeah, just sent get me you on out of my there. way. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, get out of we here, have, man. We have real problems. Yeah, stop wasting our time, bro. Okay, so again, this is not stuff I, I'm dying to ask about, but I got to do it. We're talking about jackass, and there's one of the most difficult scenes for me to get through was the yellow snow cone. Uh, oh. A man urinates into snow. He puts it into a snow cone container, and he eats it. Uh, I'm sorry for saying all of that to you. I hope you guys are not eating while listening. Um, but yeah, what I, I, I it, it did come up for me in my head of like, oh, well, how bad is this actually? Like, because people say that urine is sterile, uh, but uh, I wanted to throw it to you. Yeah, so your own urine is relatively sterile. Um, you should not, but could technically drink your own urine. Um, it has such a little water percentage after, like that's the always survival thing. Oh, I'm gonna drink my own urine. Like there's a very low amount of water left in your urine, so it's not gonna do that much for you. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of other byproducts and breakdown things in there that you don't really want to be drinking. But technically speaking, as long as you like don't have an infection going on, um, it it should be relatively sterile. Um, 
and again, as long as it's your urine, you probably don't want to be drinking other people's urine. Um, I guess what you do in your own time is is up to you. But uh, uh, yeah, of the things that they do, I think that's actually probably one of the least uh, least harmful ones. It's certainly not pleasant to watch, but uh, uh, I don't think it's nearly as harmful as some of the other things in there. Wow. Okay. Awesome. So this isn't official medical advice, but Dr. Adam Goodcough is telling you probably don't drink your own urine or someone else's urine. I'll put that official. Probably you should not be drinking your own urine. That's that would be that would be good. Officially, um, probably. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. But uh, stool is the other one that that's uh, really more important to mention is that that should not be going anywhere near uh, your mouth. That is very very harmful and dangerous. And there is bacteria that is always in our gut and that is always in our stool. That's okay because it's in it's past our system already. But if you put that back in from the top, you will get very very sick. Uh. On that note, I, I want to thank you both so much for, for joining the show and for watching uh, this uh, fantastic film, a classic film. Um, I really did <laughs> weirdly enjoy it. I I've, I've enjoy all of them, I got to say. But um, but yeah, uh, Cole, if there's anything you want to tell people about, please do so. Uh, anything to tell them about? Well, you know, a formal apology for all the things I brought up to everyone. <laughs> Uh, I definitely, uh, of everyone brought up the grossest things. So <laughs> like even said, if you were eating during this, I, I, I cook a lot while I listen to podcasts. So I'm sorry if I ruined your dinner. Uh, but other than that, I had a great time and, uh, Adam, you are the coolest. Yeah, he really is. Dr. Cool. Um, where can people find don't tell comedy? I mean, I assume they should all go see these shows. Yeah, Don't Tell Comedy is, uh, we got shows all around the country, most major cities, some smaller ones as well. You can check us out at DontTellComedy.com. You can hit us up uh, on Instagram as well. Pretty much all social platforms at Don't Tell Comedy. And then you can find my stand-up at, uh, on my Instagram as well, which is just at Cole Takes Photos. That's it. Awesome. At Cole Takes Photos, thank you so much, Cole. I appreciate yeah. that you brought up those personal things, being an open book here on the show. Uh, and Dr. Adam, something you want to tell people about? Yeah, uh, the same. I hope you weren't uh, weren't eating because my <laughs> sense of what is nasty has totally gone out the window. Uh, I'll do those things and then go eat uh, while at work. So uh, I'm used to it all. But uh, I hope that this was you know helpful or, or entertaining and educational for folks. It's been a pleasure. Um, you know, to talk with both of you, Ethan and Cole, appreciate your time. And uh, we have the same, you know, if you want to give give a follow, it's over uh, at See The Med Life on Instagram and TikTok. And we have the YouTube channel, which is just The Med Life. And uh, have some exciting new stuff coming on YouTube here in the spring, too. So if you like health and explanations, there's going to be a pretty exciting opportunity coming there. So just follow the social media for, for information as we can release it. And uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. An absolute pleasure to talk to you. I hope you guys do follow him and... and uh, and stay healthy, stay safe, and we will talk to you next time. Bye-bye. Thanks for checking out The Good, The Bad, and The Science on Seeker Plus. Is there a movie with some bad science you want us to talk about? Let us know in the comments. Or maybe it's good science. Whatever, we'll do it either way. Also, don't forget to like this video and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episodes.